meditation. But first, the politics of feminization. With just 12 news cycles left before the election, high-profile women on both sides of this race were out in force today. In Winston-Salem, North Carolina, this afternoon, Hillary Clinton made her first and possibly only campaign appearance with another soon-to-be former first lady, Michelle Obama. And it was a buddy picture unlike anything we have ever seen before. Seriously, is there anyone more inspiring than Michelle Obama? She and the president have been such wonderful friends to me and my family. It's meant the world, the world to me. If people wonder, yes, Hillary Clinton is my friend. I admire and respect Hillary. She has been a lawyer, a law professor, first lady of Arkansas, first lady of the United States, a U.S. senator, secretary of state. That's right. <laughs> Hillary doesn't play. <laughs> she has more experience and exposure to the presidency than any candidate in our lifetime. Yes, more than Barack, more than Bill. So she is absolutely ready to be commander in chief on day one. And yes, she happens to be a woman. Meanwhile, in Springfield, Ohio, Donald Trump held his own rally, backdrop by several Women for Trump signs. But it was his wife, Melania, who stole the show in two interviews that aired this morning, one with David Brody on the Christian Broadcast Network, the other with George Stephanopoulos on Good Morning America, in which Melania defended her husband and dismissed the women who have accused him of sexual assault. They were lies, and as I said before, all the accusations, they should uh, be handled in a court of law. To accuse somebody uh, without evidence, it's very hurtful and it's very damaging and unfair. And, um, but honestly, do we still need to talk about that? I think American people want to hear the problems that we have in America. She's so right about they, that. She's so they, right about that. They want to hear what we will do to make America better. Let's talk about jobs. Let's talk about secure our border. That's what American people want to hear about. Think, it. What do you need prayer for, if you will? That's what we say in the evangelical world. Well, we always say help. Health is the most important because if you have health, you could keep going, keep fighting, and uh, do the best uh, for the people of America. Mark, we've been saying for months that Donald Trump has to improve his standing with women to have any chance whatsoever at winning the White House. At this moment, given all things, where do those efforts stand? Well, today, the Michelle Obama appearance is going to dominate. You know, she's been out on the trail some, but not a lot, and obviously the two of them appearing today. Since the summer, Donald Trump has actually cut the gap to some extent nationally in some states on women with Hillary Clinton, but mostly that's as Republican women come home, but not enough. I think, I think if Hillary Clinton continues on the trajectory she's on, despite Donald Trump talking occasionally about child care, despite Melania coming out and doing a few interviews in the last few days, the combination of the Clinton campaign's relentless focus on female voters and the Access Hollywood tape, I think, is going to leave Donald Trump with, unless something dramatic changes, a very big gap with women that will make it mathematically impossible for him to win. Well, <coughs> there, there's the long, there are long-term questions here about the Republican brand, damage being done to it. You know, we can talk about Newt Gingrich and Megyn Kelly the other night, various things that are going on. I'm actually somewhat surprised. I, for the purposes of this segment, went back and looked at the exit polls from 2012, where Barack Obama beat uh, uh, Mitt Romney by 11 points, 55-44, according to the exit polls with women. Um, Hillary Clinton right now, according to CNN ORC, is up by 13 with women. Quinnipiac up by 15. Uh, Bloomberg up by 14. That's actually surprisingly, she's not doing substantially better yeah. than Barack Obama did. Now, again, Barack Obama won the election and Hillary Clinton's doing better with women. So, um, but I'm, I'm surprised the floor has not fallen out from underneath Donald Trump more with women than it has so far, given everything that's just happened over well, the course over, of the last over month. The, over the summer, he was more like 20 points down. Yes, right. So <clears throat> some of that has come back. I think that if you, if you look back at the Trump campaign's arc, uh, and their aspirations to appeal to women, African Americans, Hispanics, th th their efforts their efforts were so slow in starting, so haphazard, and uh, he is going to, if he loses, is going to leave a legacy of 
no blueprint whatsoever, except in a negative sense of how a Republican Party at the presidential level can do better. Well, and also he's going to leave a legacy, which again gets to Newt Gingrich and Megyn Kelly, where he has put his surrogates, the people around him, now they put themselves in this position, they decided to stick by him, but he's put them in a horrible position where they have had to defend yeah. um, him from charges that are largely credible, only because he admitted on the tape that he does these kind of things to women. Um, they've had to defend him, and those, that tape will play for a long time and hurt the Republican Party, I think, with... They're going to have to do a lot of rebuilding to yeah. get what to a place with he, women they need to What he said, at, uh, giving an attaboy to Newt Gingrich yesterday, was for a guy that close to... Incredible. Like, inexplicable. Incredible. All right, Republicans are calling it a bombshell memo. Another WikiLeaks disclosure, one of the biggest yet, giving fresh ammunition to claims of impropriety in Clinton world, or as longtime Clinton aide Doug Band calls it in a newly revealed document, Bill Clinton, Inc. In the 2011 message, Band, then an advisor to the Clinton Foundation, a longtime aide to Bill Clinton, appears to describe a system that generated a lot of money for the Clintons. According to the memo, corporate clients of Tenio, Band's consulting firm, made big charitable donations to the Clinton Foundation, while at the same time hiring Bill Clinton to the tune of millions of dollars in speaking fees and consulting gigs. Those deals also included, quote, in-kind services for the president and his family for personal travel, hospitality, vacation, and the like. Today, at an Ohio rally, Donald Trump addressed these emails directly, and he minced no words. The more emails WikiLeaks releases, the more lines between the Clinton Foundation, the Secretary of State's office, and the Clinton's personal finances they all get blurred. Just today, we read about Clinton confidant Doug Brand bragging that he had funneled tens of millions of dollars to Bill Clinton, Inc. through the foundation donations, paid speeches, and consulting contracts. Mr. Band called the arrangement unorthodox. The rest of us call it outright corrupt. There's another email from WikiLeaks Disclosure that people are talking about today, a lot of Republicans. This one is from 2014. It appears to show Doug Banz setting up a meeting between a Tenio client and John Podesta. Then he was a White House senior advisor. He's now, of course, chair of Hillary Clinton's campaign. All this feeds into a pay-to-play narrative that the Clinton campaign has been desperately trying to shut down in the closing days before Election Day. So, John, how will this description of Clinton world and these latest emails operate about how the Clinton Foundation and Clinton world operated play with voters between now and Election Day. Let, let me say at the outset that I have always thought, um, much more so than Hillary Clinton's emails, that the nexus of money, uh, the, the philanthropic work, and potentially, potentially policy um, more areas of real concern politically for the Clintons uh, going for, as we go forward. And these emails describe a messy, ugly, seedy, skeezy bunch of business, okay? So there's no getting around that. It is the case that Donald Trump's a horrible messenger on this issue because of the problems with the Trump Foundation. And, and it's his also, inability to articulate things like yes, this. Yes, and because the Trump Foundation is, is at least as corrupt, if not more corrupt. And also, there is the piece that I speculated might be shown, but has not yet been, which is that any of this has influenced policy in any way. So those two things, I think, undercut this as a potent issue, and it's also awfully late. It's late, and I, I think most voters who think, uh, who, who hear about this and process it think, yeah, that's the way it operates. And we should say, this is the way a lot of political families operate yeah. in government. The difference here is the scale and the fact that it's the Clintons, yes. and now that we have the descriptions of what's gone on. But there are plenty of people in Washington who arrange meetings for contributors all the time. I think... The danger here is if there's another disclosure. The press had kind of become inured to the daily release of the WikiLeaks batches. We still don't know if, if Julian Assange and others have a plan to maybe drop something big late or the Russians plan to send something over late. Some Clinton people said or, uh, uh, last week, well, they made a mistake. They, they released so much stuff early on that wasn't that big a deal. The press doesn't care anymore. The press is primed now to read these every day yes. and to try to look for things. So if there's a big thing, it will get a, a big hearing. Yes, although, again, you know, with the clock ticking here, you know, again, I'm not giving Julian Assange advice, but, you know, the, if you were really going to drop a bombshell, you, 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 you may not you, know about early voting. You don't. You, you, you know about early, You might want to not wait till the day before the election to do it if you're going to. Do drop they have early something. voting in Australia? Uh, or in uh, or in uh, uh, any, of, any of the various places that Julian Assange is associated with? It, 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 look again. 
there is a lot to criticize here. There's a lot the Clinton Foundation has done that is very good. There's a lot to criticize here. But again, it still remains very remote from the real lives of real people. And Hillary Clinton's name hasn't come up much at all. That's important. Uh, but wait, there's more. <laughs> much, much more to say, that is, about the campaign duet debut of Hillary Clinton and Michelle Obama. We'll bring in two reporters on the Clinton beat to help us with that after this quick break. unprecedented for a sitting first lady to be so actively engaged in a presidential campaign. And, and that may be true, <laughs> but what's also true is that this is truly an unprecedented election. And that's why I'm out here. That was, of course, more of Michelle Obama, the star of Hillary Clinton's rally today in North Carolina making a joint appearance, former and current First Lady. Joining us now, one of the best reporters in the business, Anne Guerin, political correspondent for The Washington Post. She is in the nation's capital. Um, what do you think of the body language? I remember back in 2008, Bill Clinton and Barack Obama did one event together uh, in the general election, and the body language was not all that warm. It seemed pretty warm to me today. Yeah, it, it, it was. I mean, they came out uh, uh, together, um, not totally, you know, in the classic Clinton arm-in-arm uh, uh, -arm pose uh, that uh, uh, you would see maybe um, with a vice president, uh, but but very, you know, close together. And, and Michelle Obama made a point of saying that she considers Clinton a friend. Uh, I think that was in some ways a nod to the perception that, that they do not have a particularly close close relationship. It's certainly true that they don't have a, an enormous amount of experience with one another uh, and that their relationship wasn't so great eight years ago um, in the aftermath of, of the 2008 uh, election. It has grown considerably deeper and warmer since. And I thought Michelle Obama really had substantive things to say today about what she thought Clinton could do as president that go beyond a standard one Democrat endorsing another kind of stump speech. 
And I think one of the big stories of 2016 is the just undeniable reality that Michelle Obama is now the biggest star in the Democratic Party. She's she's performing at a level even higher than her husband, but she's not out as often as her husband, who's doing a lot of campaigning right now. How much are we going to see of her between now and Election Day? A, a fair amount, much a surprisingly uh, large amount, uh, even by the Clinton campaign's uh, expectations. They have, they will tell you, they are surprised uh, that Michelle Obama wants to do as much as she is volunteering to do, uh, and they say they are not pressuring her to do more, uh, but that in fact she came to them with a number of proposals about things that she wanted to talk about, uh, and and including uh, today's event uh, as a side by side uh, with Hillary Clinton. It, I think one data point that, that is telling is that they booked a really, really big uh, venue today. It's a, it's a stadium that, in some configurations, can seat 14,000 people. Uh, the way it was configured today, it's, it seats fewer than that, uh, and that there was a capacity crowd of about 11,000, according to the fire marshal. That is more than twice the size uh, of, of really any of the, any but the very, very two or three largest Clinton rallies we've seen seen all year. Uh, crowd sizes in, in at recent rallies, and I mean, we are two weeks from the election, crowd sizes at recent rallies have been more in the uh, 1,700, 2,500, maybe 3,000 range, certainly not 11,000. Um, I'm going to switch over and talk about the WikiLeaks and the Doug Ban disclosures. You know, uh, Jennifer Palmieri was on MSNBC earlier today, and no matter what Chris Jansing asked her, she basically said, the Russians, the Russians, this was done by the Russians. Do, yeah. do you get the sense that they plan to keep that up basically as their answer for the next two weeks, or, or is something going to force their hand? Well, I, they don't think something has forced their hand yet. Uh, I, I, it, it certainly appears that with 12 days left, uh, they think they can can gut it out by just continually saying this is stolen property. By the way, it was stolen by the Russians. And has anybody taken a good hard look at, at Donald Trump's connection to the Russians? All good questions, all valid points, but completely beside the point to the uh, really mounting pile of dirty laundry that we see uh, in, in, in the these emails. Uh, notably, they do not dispute the authenticity of these emails. They simply won't confirm it. Um, and do you think, I mean, well, first of all, it'll be interesting to point out today that Donald Trump again went out and sang Vladimir Putin's praises again on the campaign trail, giving the Clinton campaign a little bit of a gift there. Do, do you, how, to what extent is the campaign now fully aware? I mean, have they totally gone through all of John Podesta's Gmail, Gmail now so they know what Assange has and they could be prepared as these things come out between now and Election Day? Well, God, you'd hope so, right? I mean, uh, the, he it, just to know what the what the potential trove is that that that's out there. Um, one uh, one thing we really don't know from the outside is exactly when it was clear to the campaign that this material had been stolen, and exactly how much they knew about the the size and scope um, of of that theft. Uh, Podesta apparently never deleted anything. He had many many years. Of, of email uh, stored uh, on in, in his Gmail. Uh, so what, with one, apparently one hack, uh, the whoever did it was able to, to go back many years, spanning Podesta's time out of government uh, at the White House and as he was uh, in the chairman in waiting of, of, of the campaign. So it's an awful lot uh, that, that was exposed there. Um, and you have to think that the Clinton campaign and lawyers uh, have been trying you know, going through that uh, for months. We we knew that they knew that that there was a uh, a risk out there. We just didn't know exactly what it was. And we talked about it earlier, but I'd love to hear you just enunciate it. We've seen weeks, days and days of these emails come out. The, the batch release yesterday produced front page stories in your paper, the Wall Street Journal, New York Times. What was it about that ban memo that you think caused people to make a bigger deal than of most of the previous emails? Well, it, it drew a lot of lines uh, that that we've really only uh, seen the, the the traces of before. Uh, it, it drew them quite explicitly, um, and and beyond that, here you have Doug Band, once uh, one of Bill Clinton's uh, most loyal and and trusted closest aides, 
uh, appearing to to point fingers at the boss, right, at, at Bill Clinton, saying, look, you know, how come you're uh, saying that I shouldn't be doing some of these overlapping, having some of this overlapping uh, business and charitable relationships, uh, some of these, when Bill Clinton has uh, far more than I do uh, and, and has even greater exposure, if, if you consider it a risk, he has greater exposure than I do. Um, that's a fairly extraordinary thing for, for someone uh, in his position and, frankly, who owed his position to Bill Clinton to say. And one interesting aspect of it, which I think raised the profile of it and caused us to write about it um, in the detail we did, is that, you know, you, here you see uh, John Podesta trying to tamp this down a little bit and saying, hey, cool it a little bit. I don't think that's quite the language you want to use. Uh, and Band is saying, oh, no, that is exactly what I wanted, what I want to say, and I want to defend myself. Okay, and Garen, thank you very much. Up next, more on WikiLeaks. We talk about Russia and the future of cyber warfare right after this. There's been a lot of discussion of WikiLeaks and the Russian connection, but few people who really, I mean really, understand the methods, context, and meaning behind the hacks and hackers that have been meddling in this year's election. For The Circus, our Showtime documentary series produced in conjunction with Bloomberg Politics, I talked with two of those people, and what they had to say was super scary. Friday morning, Washington, D.C. WikiLeaks and the Russian connection obviously matters a lot trying to explore this very question. How are you, man? Yeah, good to see you. What's going on? So your first encounter with this story was what? Well, we have seen a lot of Russian activity going around, but the, the big moment of change came in June uh, of this year when a, a company called CrowdStrike first came out with pretty convincing evidence that there were Russian hackers who were behind the attack on the Democratic National Committee. Dimitri. Dimitri, how are you? Good to see you, man. Good to see you. Come on in. Um, okay, let's shoot some pool. 
So the DNC had called us. They didn't know if they had a breach, but they um, saw some suspicious signs in their network. So they called us in, and within a couple hours, we noticed that there were actually two adversaries on their network, which we tied to the Russian military intelligence an agency called GRU. And the other group, which we actually tied to the FSB, the successor to the KGB, their primary intelligence agency. I actually think that they did not plan to start leaking in the summer. Uh, with us going public with our attribution, right. completely accelerated their timeline. They panicked and they said, we need a distribution channel. Why don't we go to WikiLeaks? And because WikiLeaks is WikiLeaks, it's like having something appear on the front page of a big newspaper. And then we suddenly realized that this was sort of old style Russian information warfare. That's exactly what it is. It's information operations. Right. And that's how the Russians actually think of cyber. They think about it, how do we use cyber to weaken our opponent's defenses psychologically? The goal is not just to try to influence the election in favor of one candidate or the other, but to actually discredit the entire process. You don't have to hack all 50 states. Right. All you need to do is create enough chaos, maybe in the voter registration rolls. You show up, sorry your name's not on the list, that happens to a thousand people in the line behind you, right. and that just sows doubt about the quality of the vote. And that plays into Putin's uh, overall objective, which is ultimately to weaken the American presidency. It is certainly my belief that the goal is not just to try to influence the election in favor of one candidate or the other, but to actually discredit the entire process. I think his motive is to show that he's got more than nuclear weapons in his arsenal and to show that he has to be reckoned with and dealt with with some respect. It's all about influence. It's all about propaganda. That's how the Russians think about this. So the government is not prepared for the propaganda campaign that's about to unfold. Yeah, yeah. Man, I'm, now you're starting to freak me out. So today Vladimir Putin said that it was rubbish that the uh, Russian president or Russia was behind Donald Trump, but there is no doubt at this point uh, among most experts that Russia has the, was, the, had, was the one who drove this hack, and uh, somehow those documents made their way to WikiLeaks and Julian Assange. Uh, you can watch Circus on the Showtime on Sunday nights at 8 p.m. or pretty much anytime on Showtime, anytime. Uh, up next right here, though, we're going to take a deeper look at this issue at Cyber War and how it might flare up in a big way on Election Day with one of the guys you just saw, that's The New York Times' David Sanger, and another one who you didn't see, that's Stephen Levy of Back Channel. But first, these words from our sponsors.
Неужели кто-то всерьез думает? Is there anyone who really thinks in full seriousness that Russia is capable of influencing the choice of the American people somehow? America is not a banana country, is it? America is a great power. If I'm not right, please correct me. Was Russian President Vladimir Putin today speaking in Sochi about a banana country, where he dismissed concerns that his government is meddling in the U.S. election? Just before the break, you saw John's conversation with the New York Times national security correspondent, Mr. David Sanger. That was filmed for our Showtime documentary series, The Circus, produced in conjunction with Bloomberg Politics. Airs on Showtime Sunday nights at 8. We're joined now by the man himself, David Sanger. He's in the Times DC newsroom and here with us on the set, technology reporter and editor of Back Channel, Stephen Levy. Thank you both for coming. David, update us on what your latest sense is of, of what the U.S. government's posture is towards trying to retaliate against the Russians or taking some measure to either punitive or, or, or discouraging of them continuing what the U.S. government says they're doing? Well, so far, the, uh, the discouraging of their activity has been limited to public statements they've made, including the one that Joe Biden made a bit more than a week ago now, threatening some kind of uh, covert action to stop them. But the fact of the matter is, uh, we haven't seen public sanctions. And if there has been covert action, it's been pretty subtle. And, and so far, the only thing we've seen is the revelation in the Ukraine of some emails of uh, an aide fairly close to, um, to Mr. Putin about their actions in Ukraine. No one's quite convinced that that was American action, that, that, uh, that if the U.S. did something, they were hoping it would be a little bigger than that. Uh, there is some debate about whether or not the administration should even act before the election, because if you do act before the election, that gives uh, the Russians a chance to act back on the day of. So it's possible you're not going to see real retaliation until uh, after November 8th. Um, I want to ask you this question, Stephen, just, just to start down the path that I really want to go down, which is what happens next, potentially. Forget about WikiLeaks and the stuff they're right. putting out, trying to screw with, uh, with this election and mess up with Hillary Clinton. Uh, what about Election Day? Mm -hmm. What's the risk? Well, there, there, there's a lot of risk. We saw last week a big attack on some Internet companies, uh, you know, on the infrastructure of the Internet there. And uh, if that happened during Election Day, maybe as a broader attack, uh, there would be a, a good amount of chaos there. A, a lot of the And still no indication who was responsible for that, right? No, we don't know. It, the, the feeling was this was not an international attack. It wasn't a foreign government doing that. But uh, other people think it's a, it's a probe. And then again, there could be chaos. It doesn't have to be the Russians. It could be, um, you know, uh, individual actors in anywhere in the world, really. Uh, so there's been a lot of people talking for, really, for a few cycles now about the vulnerability of our election systems. One thing that's in our favor is it's not one centralized system. So if you're going to attack uh, uh, the general election system, uh, probably the best way would be over the whole Internet in general, because there's 51 different states and districts who right. are voting there, and each one has a different system. Hey, David, I, I want to talk to you about the one of the things we, we know. The voting machines are not online, right? That's the, that's they're 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 not hooked into the internet. Obviously, as Stephen suggests, if if there was a massive outage in the internet, that would create a certain kind of atmospheric chaos. But the thing you and I discussed down in Washington was something more specific, going to the question of to affecting voter registration, and those systems are online. So just sketch out the scenario by which that could create some chaos and pandemonium on election day. Sure. So, you know, the possibility here is you've got a lot of people who are newly registered. They register into a central uh, database. And uh, they show up on Election Day, and they've got their little receipt from the day they registered, if they remember to bring it, but nobody can find them. Then they have to vote on a provisional ballot. If you had a lot of those, if you had thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands, it would really slow the works down. And you might not even get conclusions uh, that night. Um, now, a lot of states are preparing for that. Many of them are printing out their database or printing it out in sections and giving it to the polling places so that uh, there's a backup to the system. Uh, but as uh, you've just heard, every state is different. 
and as a result, everyone's got different procedures. Same is true when you get to the actual voting in the voting machines. Most of them are offline, although there are a lot of people who are overseas or veterans who are allowed to vote by email. There's some question about the security of that. And uh, even if that happens, there are a lot of states, five in specific, that do not have any paper backup to the ballot that you cast. So if there's a question later on, very little to, to uh, go back and, and do the audit. Other states have only partial backup. You know, if you, if you wanted to slow down and generally have some polling places uh, where there was some chaos and, you know, you were hacking it, the question would be, how could they really tell? Because I, I can guarantee with confidence that there's going to be polling places in this district or that uh, where people are going to be lined up, not able to vote. There's going to be people to show up to say, I'm, I could legally vote, and they're not going to be able to vote there. Uh, you know, I think there's a 100 percent chance of that happening anyway. Right, but obviously wider spread cast after the entire sure, absolutely. polling place yeah. was shut down. I ask you about WikiLeaks. To the extent we understand their motives, their goals, do you think they're feeling that what they've done with the Podesta emails has been a success? I think from uh, Julian Assange's point, yes, it has been a success. By what metric? Um, it's been a success. I mean, certainly the, the, the very first one where they be able to get the head of the DNC to resign, right? That, that, that's, a, that's a pretty good hit. Um, it's interesting. Some of the, the ones that came out, uh, you know, talking about uh, Hillary's speeches there, had they come out during the primaries, I think they would have had a bigger impact there. Right. Uh, their impact was greatly reduced because it happened to be the same day that we watched uh, Donald Trump uh, in the trailer talking about, uh, you know, uh, his views on women, right? So th they, were, they were pretty much overshadowed there. So I think generally he feels, you know, that there is an impact. Again, we don't know what, if anything, is to come. The way I've seen something interesting happening as these male drops keep happening is that they have successively less impact there. So I'm, I, my hopeful view is that we're getting desensitized now to what's in private e emails there. And so maybe there's some version of order restored to the universe as we realize that just because email is stolen, it isn't necessarily uh, salacious uh, on its face. All right, David, we had Y2K, which is a different proposition, but the same kind of anticipation of a potentially cataclysmic event. And we see when there's a Super Bowl or other things, there, the so-called national security events. How much of the limited bandwidth of the intelligence community uh, is, and, and computer experts within the federal government is going towards preparing for Election Day? I've just been talking to some people who've been involved in that effort, and they're preparing for it in a monitoring sense. But remember, the voting system is a state and local system in the United States. And so not only is there no central database, there's no central authority, no federal authority over this. In fact, uh, as we discussed the other day, uh, the voting system is not considered to be critical infrastructure. The Washington Monument is, the Jefferson Memorial is, movie theaters are, but not the underpinnings of our democracy. That's something likely to change uh, after uh, Election Day. So you have federal government officials who can look for signs of trouble. But they don't have a lot of authority here because that authority is vested in the states. David, I want to stay with you real quick just to talk about one other Election Day scenario, which is the possibility that an intrusion could happen in terms of how the vote totals are reported in on television networks and in other media. Talk about that a little bit because that could obviously also cause some chaos. It, it sure can. And remember, the vote totals that you hear on Election Eve are unofficial totals. They're sort of a quick put together. And let's say in a close state like North Carolina, the early results you got were uh, Donald Trump up by three. And, I'm, of course, I'm making up these numbers, right? And then a few days later, after all the official numbers are together and all of the, the um, mail-in ballots are counted and everything else, what you hear is, no, Hillary Clinton won it by one. You're going to have a lot of Trump supporters under that circumstance say, hey, something suspicious happened here. Yep. I heard the, that night that he won and now she won. Was somebody playing with the numbers? So the answer might be that somebody was playing with the preliminary numbers but not with the real numbers. Right. David Sanger, thank you. Stephen Levy, thank you both. Thank you. When we come back, we'll head inside the Trump bunker for a look at the campaign's data shop. And if you're watching us in Washington, D.C., you can now listen to us on the radio radio at Bloomberg 99.1 FM. We'll be right back.
Donald Trump's behind-the-scenes data operation has been something his campaign has kept almost entirely from public view. But Bloomberg Businessweek's Josh Green and Sasha Eisenberg were granted exclusive access to the people, the strategy, the ads, and a large part of the data itself that the Trump campaign is using in the final days of this election season. And possibly beyond. We are joined now by one of the authors of that piece from our Washington bureau, Sasha Eisenberg. It is great to see you here uh, and your beard. Um, tell us about your story, Sasha. Yeah, so Josh and I went down to San Antonio where the Trump campaign has built um, basically a second headquarters. There are more people who go to work in an office off of a, uh, a freeway near the airport in San Antonio than go to Trump Tower every day. And it's where Trump has built this sort of data digital operation that they've been um, loath to talk about. He got through the primary um, by doing very little beyond TV interviews, rallies, using social media um, uh, out of his own account as a sort of broadcast medium. But since he got the nomination from June onward, they've built a uh, uh, a system that's that's doing a lot of targeted communication and collecting a lot of data on his supporters. And this was really the first time that they they pulled back the curtain to talk about what they've been up to. One of the things the senior officials quoted in the story is saying uh, caught my eye in the eyes of a lot of people. It's yeah. something that's come up before about the notion of voter suppression. Here's part of what you write in the piece uh, in Business Week. We have a, a senior uh, uh, aide says we have three major voter suppression operations underway. This is a quote. They're aimed at three groups Clinton needs to win overwhelmingly. Idealistic white liberals, young women, and African Americans. So, yeah, campaigns are sometimes engaged in voter suppression. But why would someone say that, given the optics of it? I think that this is evidence of a campaign that is run by uh, a sort of uh, top tier of people who have very little, if any, experience around uh, political campaigns. Um, you look at uh, Steve Bannon, Jared Kushner, Brad Parscale, who we write about at length, the digital director of this campaign. Um, these are people who, who have very little uh, experience at all, and I think that they've developed a strategy which is sort of dubious from a uh, 
a sort of scientific perspective, but they have no idea how fraught the term suppression is. They think that what they're doing is basically going to the most unreliable parts of the Democratic coalition, these groups that uh, were, were, you have a lot of voters who are not regular voters, and where polls show uh, not a lot of enthusiasm for Hillary Clinton over the end of the year, over the course of the year, and they think that if they give them negative information about Hillary Clinton, it'll keep them home. That's a little different than I think what the term suppression means legally, but um, the fact that they threw that around as freely as they did with us, I think, is a sign that you know they don't come out of a political milieu where they but realize you that that's a You don't need that to that be a political a expert. Word. You just need to have some sense of morality and PR to not say that to a journalist. Yeah, you know, I mean, so, so this grows out of basically their strategic assumption at the end of the campaign, which is that they have this um, very uh, fervent base um, you know, that's the thing that's getting them to 42 or 43 or 44 percent in state polls. Um, they recognize that that's not going to be enough for a plurality in enough states to get 270 electoral votes. And so their strategic assumption at this point is the only way that they can turn their coalition into a winning number is to shrink the size of the electorate. And this is their gambit to go after groups that they, um, where they think they have the most chance to reduce turnout among Democrats. Sasha, your piece is, is pretty unambiguous about two things. One, that they understand that they're almost certain to lose, and two, that they have longer-term ambitions uh, along the lines that a lot of people suspect, trying to build some kind of a media operation uh, on the back of this movement. Talk about that. Yeah, you know, so... Um, Trump has given the indication that he doesn't much trust polling. They're doing a ton of it from a lot of different places. Every night they run electoral simulations that predict their likelihood of winning. And, you know, we quote in the piece, uh, Brad Parscale, the digital director, saying that basically their numbers are tracking Nate Silver's at 538, but with a lag because they're not relying on public polls. Um, they know they're going to lose, and what comes after is probably either a splinter political movement or the sort of Trump media property that we've all been talking about, and they will have 13 million names they've collected over the course of this year uh, to be an audience or, or a, a constituency for either. All right. Sasha P. Victory Lab Eisenberg. The story is fantastic. Everyone should read it. It breaks a lot of news. You can find that piece on our website at BloombergPolitics.com and in the latest edition of Bloomberg Business Week. Up next, it is time for some... Meditation. We'll be right back. With 12 days left in this election, the campaign may have you burnt out, run down, 
and maybe a little stressed out. If you are any of those things, you're not alone. Joining us now to talk about the stresses of this election cycle and how to handle them is the co-anchor of ABC News Nightline and of Good Morning America Weekend, the great Dan Harris. <laughs> also, the author of the book. Wow, thank you. 10% Happier, New York Times bestseller, co-founder of the 10% Happier app, and the host of the 10% Happier podcast, a 10% Happier Inc., as yes. you say. Wow. Dan, welcome. So... <clears throat> We all anecdotally know a lot of stressed people yeah. related to the election. How pervasive is election 16 stress? It's quite pervasive. I mean, just looking at the numbers, the American Psychological Association finds that more than half of Americans are, say that the election is giving them anxiety. 25% of Americans saying it's getting in the way of them doing their work because of political discussions in the workplace. 50% say the prospect of a Clinton presidency makes them anxious. 70% for Trump. 7% say they've lost friends over this election. So it's pretty bad. So it's not just Doug Band. No, it's not just Doug Band. <laughs> He's having a tough cycle, no question about it. Also, doctors all over the country are reporting people with heart palpitations, stomach problems, sleeping problems, stress eating, and compulsive cleaning, not a problem I've had. All right, so this is sort of like a rare utilitarian segment on this show. We're pretending to be a morning show here. So, um, so uh, like a so, venue I know well. So, so what do we? So, what am I supposed to do about it, Dan? Uh, well, thank you for teaming me up. That was a softball. Yeah. I'm, a, I'm. I think there are three big tips. One is limit your. I, this is a tough thing to say on television, but limit your media consumption. We have to stay informed, but don't do too much. And this with is, all due respect, just, little else. Just with all due respect, <laughs> maybe Nightline if you have time. Uh, also. Uh, the the big piece of advice that doctors are now recommending uh, across the country, privately and publicly, is meditation. I'm obviously a big proponent a proponent yeah. of that, yeah. um, but I do think it really helps. Yeah. In fact, in fact, we've pro posted some free guided meditations for people who are freaked out about this election. Posted them where? On our, thank you, Mark. Thank you on our app. Ten percent happier. Yeah. yeah um, smoking dope. Smoking dope, I, I don't know if there's any research that's gone into that, but uh, uh, one of your, I don't want to name any names, but his, his initials are Afonso Pena, one of your stage <laughs> managers over here, is applauding vigorously. See if, I, see, if I wrote yeah. a book about this, that would be my only advice. Yes, it's smoke dope. All right, what about, we'll see how that does what about meditation? Is that going to help someone who's never done it before with 12 days to go? Yeah, I do think so. I think actually meditation works really quickly. Uh, it's not, you know, because you actually, you and your lovely wife-to-be, Karen, helped me write the book. A lot of people don't know this, but this is one of my closest friends over here. You're not, you're not nothing either. Uh, I don't view meditation as some magical, woo-woo, metaphysical fix. It's brain exercise. And just the way you, when you exercise your body, your muscles get stronger, your heart gets stronger, you get more limber. When you exercise your brain, you get less yanked around by your emotions. And that's what's happening here. We feel helpless, we feel anxious, we feel angry. And we're allowing that to get us into arguments with our coworkers or our spouses, or we're kicking the dog. And meditation just helps you not get so yanked around by it. Well, um, uh, but the, you know, there's a kind of a general, I think, a, precept, a perception that like meditation is kind of hippy-dippy. Yes. Bull crap. Yes. Bull pucky, right? But you're a pretty straight laced guy, yeah. right? You're saying, no, this is like a legitimate thing. Absolutely. I was of the view that meditation is for people who are really into Cat Stevens and crystals and, you know, we wear finger symbols and, and collect. You say um, like those are like, say like that, those are bad things. Well, I mean, is that, is that finger how Finger symbols and Cat Stevens are, are great. I'm all for that. I didn't that. know that. Yeah. We now know that he smokes dope and uh, likes finger symbols. Yeah, uh, yeah, and those two things are connected. But yeah, go on. In many cases, causation's not, uh, co correlation, not necessarily causation. But yeah. anyway, uh, uh, I, yes, I was of the view that it's completely weird uh, for a long time, but then I started to look at the science, and the science shows that it can boost your immune system, rewire key parts of your brain, lower your blood pressure, and so then I started to give it a shot. And look, there are, there are plenty of weird kinds of meditation you can do, yeah. uh, but I think if you do the straight-up secular mindfulness meditation, which is what I am a proponent of, you're in good hands. So it doesn't have to be transcendental to work. Uh, you can transcend uh, based on you can transcend in, in lots of environments. I can stay away from the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi and still meditate and still be okay. <laughs> a lot of people do TM who are uh, pretty straight laced. You got a nightline coming up on this? I do. We when went is to, that? We what went is to, it? It's going to be on next week. I just got off the train from Philadelphia. We convened uh, a panel of Clinton supporters and Trump supporters, and we had them meditate together. It was really interesting. It was super tense in the room because these people have serious disagreements. By the end. Actually, they started talking about, and this is going to sound a little grandiose, but I think it's a point worth making in this, at this juncture in our history, shared humanity. These are people who had just come from basically shooting daggers out of their eyes at one another. So strong Trump supporters, strong Clinton supporters. Yes. By the end, we're singing Kumbaya. Something to that effect. Yeah. Uh, tell us again the app. 
and 10 how, and how happier. Use it. It's available in the App Store. Yeah. Also, if you don't have an Apple uh, uh, phone, you can get it at 10%happier.com slash election. Let me ask you this question. Yeah. This has always bothered me. Yeah. Why only 10% happier? It seems like you're aiming a little low. Like, that's, you know, why not aim higher? Yeah, well, I, I pulled it out of my rear end. Uh, basically, okay. it's a joke. Um, <laughs> thank you for not getting the joke. Um, I think... <laughs> Uh, I mean, I'd like to be 90% happier. I'm counter. Well, if you. 190% happier. Like just, you know. I'm trying to counter program against the reckless over hyping and over promising of the $11 billion a year bullcrap machine known as the self help industry. So I'm basically saying. But this book will happier. change your life. Yes. Okay. Good. Yes. Yeah. Incrementally. Yes. Yeah. yes. Incrementally. The Dan Harris. 10% <laughs> happier. Thank you, Thank you very much. Sirs. Appreciate it. John and I will be Danless and back right after this. Scale of one to Godzilla, how much you love that guy? Dan Harris? Yeah. Godzilla, Godzilla Plus. All right, Godzilla <laughs> Plus. All right, I, me too. Head to BloombergPolitics.com right now to see what Donald Trump's followers are saying about the wide-ranging conspiracy to steal the election. Lynch. Coming up on Bloomberg Technology, Emily Chang breaks down Amazon's earnings until now, or until tomorrow, for me and Mark. Sayonara.
I'm Mark Crumpton. You're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's begin with a check of first word news. A senior advisor to Donald Trump tells Bloomberg Businessweek the campaign has three so-called voter suppression operations aimed at lowering the turnout for Hillary Clinton. The campaign targets liberals, young women, and black voters, three groups critical to Clinton's path to the White House. The latest batch of hacked emails from Hillary Clinton's campaign reveals her staff's anger after news broke that she used a private server. The emails were among those released today by WikiLeaks. The group has released thousands of stolen emails from Clinton's campaign chairman, John Podesta. The United Nations will make another attempt to evacuate nearly 200 wounded people and to deliver food and medical supplies into the besieged Syrian city of Aleppo. Airstrikes by Russian and Syrian government planes have been halted for nine days in advance of the evacuations, but those efforts have failed. Amtrak will pay $265 million to settle claims related to a deadly 2015 derailment in Philadelphia. Eight people were killed, more than 200 others injured, when a speed train failed to navigate a curve. Attorneys say people will receive the money by June. Global News, 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,600 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. In New York, I'm Mark Crumpton. Bloomberg Technology is next. Coming up, Alphabet crushes estimates thanks to mobile and online video. We dive into the earnings report. Plus, Amazon shares dive in late trading after an earnings miss, and the e-commerce giant says holiday sales could also disappoint. We'll see why. And Qualcomm bets $47 billion that the future of mobile is on four wheels. We break down Qualcomm's purchase of NXP, the chip industry's biggest deal ever. But first, to our lead, Alphabet shares are higher in extended trading after posting third quarter sales and profit that beat analyst estimates. Google's steady internet ad business once again more than made up for its unprofitable moonshots and new hardware division. Revenue rose 21% from a year ago to $18.3 billion. Adjusted earnings per share climbed 23% to more than $9 a share. Key metrics on the ad side showed strength. Paid clicks jumped 42% thanks to more paid ads on YouTube. However, the cost per click did fall more than analysts had estimated. Joining us now to break it all down, Axiom Capital Management Analyst Victor Anthony in New York, ad industry expert Adam Burke of AdRoll, and our Bloomberg Tech reporter Mark Bergen who covers Alphabet for us. Victor, I want to start with you. What do you think are the biggest highlights here when it comes to the core Google business and how the ad business is actually doing? Well, you know, those expectations that uh, given the fact that Google, the core business, was facing a tough comp, that growth wouldn't have, would not have been as robust as, as what they reported. So it was a very, very strong number. The growth in core Google websites only just decelerated one point. Uh, the Wall Street was, was expecting anywhere from 300 to 400 basis points deceleration. So it was a solid print. Uh, they beat estimates on EPS as well. Um, you know, slight in the margin expansion I was looking for didn't, didn't really quite come in. There were some incremental investments, but I thought that was okay. You know, they announced a share buyback of roughly over $7 billion. Uh, it was a puzzle, so I, need, you know, I was a, I majored in a math discipline in undergrad, so I need to go back to my desk and try to figure it out. But overall, it was a solid quarter, and, um, you know, it's, it's a stock you want to continue to own. Now, Mark, you and I both spoke with a high-level Alphabet executive about this particular quarter. Uh, focus again on mobile. The, the mix is shifting, uh, which is why we're seeing uh, some transition there. Uh, but also heavy focus on the power of Google Cloud and the power of yep. Google Play. Yeah, that cloud especially. I mean, that's there. We don't know exactly what the revenues numbers are. They don't break them out. Um, but the, the percentage of the other revenues line where the cloud exists grew almost 40%. Um, and, but, you know, Amazon also with the, you know, Amazon had a rough quarter, but AWS did really well and think over 50% growth. So, you know, a lot of analysts and experts are saying that, that Google is really far behind on both Amazon and Microsoft in that industry. Uh, they've been talking about this on the call. Google CEO Sundar Pichai, uh, take a listen to what he had to say about their cloud strategy. Scaling up through partnerships is a big area of focus and investment for us. Uh, we are also establishing a, a large cloud machine learning group uh, so that we can take advantages of working with our cloud customers and make uh, machine learning more accessible uh, to all of them. 
I would say other areas are hiring across sales, engineering, and marketing. And as we head into 2017, I expect cloud to be one of our largest areas of investment and headcount growth. Uh, now, back to the advertising business, though. Adam, this is your business. I mean, obviously, mobile is driving the shift, though. Uh, they emphasize to us they're still seeing uh, a great presence on tablets, on desktop. Uh, but what's your takeaway? Um, yeah, I mean, it's similar to what we've seen in, in past announcements, that just the growth in clicks is just staggering and uh, really makes up for anything that might be happening on the CPC side, which is decreasing a little faster than people uh, expect. And that just shows the shift to mobile and the fact that um, it's not a perfect transfer, it actually grows the pie. People are spending more time on computing devices they have in their pocket. How many times are you in a conversation and it's just like, okay, let's well, just search this. And it's just like increasing that volume at such a rapid pace. And is it really still a two horse race between Google and Facebook? We're actually seeing growth across all of our marketing channels. So, uh, you know, our customers want to uh, be able to find their audiences wherever they go online. Google and Facebook are a massive share of that. But we're, we're seeing, you know, I think we're just in a really strong environment right now for performance marketing um, because we're really seeing all channels uh, grow. Okay, so let's talk about what's happening in the other bets. This is what always gets a lot of attention despite yeah. the strength of the ad business. Uh, Mark, of course,